Today, we're reviewing the Reiton Alloy 9. We'll check what this mini PC can do, can it game, and we'll see how it compares against the other 7940HS systems we've had on the channel so far. It's gonna expose one fatal flaw that most, if not all other reviews, fail to mention. Welcome to Team Pandora. Subscribe. So another package came, this time from Reaton. This mini PC was sent to us in purpose of video review. They agreed to send a small amount of cash to prioritize the video, but this review will be as non-biased as possible, all opinions are our own, and they won't see this video until it's published. So here's the box. And to get to the insides, we need to slide it out. A nice handful. And there it is. Amazing. Rieta. Something we don't really see is this amount of play. Oof. But on first impressions, this computer feels like a bit of a beast. I used to have a diesel Volkswagen Golf. It was a bit heavy like this, but in my mind, I was driving a tank. We also have a manual, which is in multiple languages. They include English, Chinese, German, Japanese, Spanish, Italian, and French. It goes over the basics, as well as upgrading your SSD and things like that. Got a nice looking warning. We'll ignore this. And a card explaining about slow boot times. Huh. At the bottom of the box, we've got some other bits. A HDMI cable. A power brick. And this one uses the barrel jack. It's made by Gen Gen Soy Technology, and it's a switching adapter, good for 100 to 240 volts, and it outputs at 19 volts, 6.38 amps, delivering a maximum of 119.7 watts. And to power this, we get an included cable. In Japan, we got the American style, with an extra pin for Earth. That is nice and all, but we should really get to the specs. The Alloy 9 Mini PC uses the 7940HS, an extremely capable CPU, and coupled with the 780M, it should provide some winning performance in applications, as well as games. Two HDMI 2.1 ports is a great addition, allowing us to run 120Hz at 4K on a compatible monitor. And we also have an extra NVMe slot, in case you want to give it some more storage, or even use it to plug up an external GPU. As for the price, it's currently going for $609 on Amazon, that is, if we use the coupon. At first glance, this Alloy 9 is very presentable, but the one we have here it looks as if the finish didn't come out greatly. Just remember that Amazon returns are easy to do, and this case is pretty sturdy metal. On the front there is a something, power switch, and two ports for USB 4. An audio jack, and a pinhole for BIOS reset. On the right side there's uh, holes, many holes. And on the back is where a lot of the action is. Along the top is where the heat gets pushed out. On the bottom, DC input. Two ports for HDMI 2.1, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet LAN, and four ports for USB 3.2. We really would have liked one of these on the front, but yeah, it is what it is. More holes, and even more underneath. And the combination of tall feet and the wedge case should help somewhat in keeping the computer quite cool. It's about time for the size comparison. The Alloy 9 is slightly larger than the Geekom A7, and the GMK Tech K4, which both have the same processor. Here's a chewy lot box. It's around four times the size of this thing. Here's the GMK Tech G5, and the B-Link Sur 6. This mini PC shares the same length and width, but it's around two millimeters shorter in height. If you compare it to the GMK Tech K9, the dimensions are identical. But it gets absolutely dwarfed when you bring in the mighty, um, floppy disk. Three and a half inches of double-sided, double destiny. Can you guess this card? Two hints. Johnny and chocolate. Three, two, one, ding! There we go. And of course, the Roy Bosch tea bag. Wait, this isn't Roy Bosch, it's Typhoo. This mini PC is four times the size of a Typhoo tea bag. After we combine it with a monitor, speakers, and only one keyboard, we can get cracking. And on first boot, we're greeted to this recovery message. Very odd to see a new computer start up with this, but after clicking on restart my PC, we get to the Windows setup screen. And this is where we answer a few questions, such as language, keyboard settings, and things like that. Unfortunately, this forces us to enter our Wi-Fi settings before allowing us to boot up and check for viruses. This is something that Microsoft has pushed, giving us yet another reason to go Linux. But there is a workaround. Push Shift and F10 to get the command prompt, 
Then type in OOBE backslash bypass NRO. If you can't find the backslash on your keyboard, find one on the screen, select it with your mouse, and then right click. Now whenever you press right click with the mouse, it'll give you a backslash. After pushing return, it will restart your computer, and you'll have another option to continue with limit setup. Obviously, you don't need to do any of this, you can just type in your Wi-Fi details, but this is a security issue, and it's started to appear on many other computers in the market. And a few minutes later, we're in Windows. This computer comes with Windows 11 Pro pre-installed, all specs check out, and everything is activated. Before we go online, we'll just check the edge settings. Everything seems to check out here. And before we type in any username or password, we'll go to netnet.com to download some free tools. We then check for malware and viruses, and we're happy to report the system is completely clean. And before going any further, we updated Windows to the latest version, as well as our drivers. We've had multiple Ryzen mini PCs on this channel, and not one of them has had any problems when it comes to Windows performance. We can use it for office tasks, creating works of art with Krita or Photoshop, and it's more than enough for music creation. We can do some video editing, but if you're after a dedicated video machine, an Intel mini PC might suit you a bit better. A Ryzen PC will be up to the task, and it'll usually take the prize when it comes to gaming. We had no problems using this for general internet use. Here's some Google Maps as we street view around Manchester. Oh look, a toilet. To 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 toilet. Of course we can do our online shopping. Or even stream some video. Here's Amazon Prime with a HD button lit. Netflix. or YouTube in 4K. And it plays beautifully. As we move on to the benchmarks, the Riaton Alloy 9 performs really well against the competition, but we need to remember that benchmarks are just a score to go by and don't always translate 100% to gaming performance. And this extremely high Cinebench score may hint that the computer has an edge when it comes to cooling. And we have pretty decent scores in Dismark, but not the best, hinting we have a PCI 3B4. Next in our testing is Wi-Fi signal strength, and at only 50%, it shows us that metal cases are not always a good idea. So to speed up downloads, we use the Ethernet LAN. We were able to connect our Bluetooth controller, and let's get to the games. First up, Expender Bros, and this completely free game is full speed. Danger-esque. It's just sitting there. There's probably at least some ash covered chewing gum. Next up is Dave the Diver, and while this can slip up slower systems, we're at full speed at 1080p. Here are everybody, I'm Dave. Last time I went for a swim, I decided to knock a few fish out with a Pico Pico hammer. This eventually escalated a little bit, so I got a baseball bat. I found a sunken ship and welded myself into it. And what did I find? This abomination! A giant squid! I know the baseball bat wouldn't do, so I tried poking its eyes out. The battle raised for a full five minutes, but eventually I tamed that beast, got a snack for myself, and brought back a trophy. Leah's Chad. Blame low indeed. Diablo 4 at 1080p high gave us from 40 to 45 FPS. And then if we turn on FSR, full 60. Grand Theft Auto for the kids, wobbly life. Moving on to some esports titles now, here's Fortnite. And at 1080p epic settings, we do get a high frame rate. But there are slight hiccups every now and then. However, if we turn textures down to high, Fortnite becomes smoother and much more enjoyable to play. Here's Rocket League, turning to be high settings with no problems whatsoever.
Counter-Strike 2. Let's pwn some noobs using a gamepad. Let's move on to the more demanding games. Here's Aim for the Nads Remake. And while this runs fairly well, to get the full 60 FPS, we needed to switch resolution down to 720p. And Cyberpunk 2077, running at 1080p, medium settings, with FSR 2.1 set to auto. And even though it's not full 60 FPS, it's definitely playable. And to add, the whole system manages to stay cool, so there's no slowdown, even after a few minutes of gameplay. Moving on to some high tier emulation now, here's Ridge Racer 7 on the PlayStation 3. Here it is in 1080p. Why about HD Fury? Star Fox Zero on the Wii U. And the very special Tekken Tag 2. Here's Sonic Mania on Rejunk Junks, and it's running at full speed. And Super Martian Prodigy. Splat. Splat. We also tried out some arcade emulation with Techno Parent, and after using the AMD fixes, we got Outrun 2 SP. Sega Rally 3 and Tekken 7 working without issue. Meow. If we take a look at the BIOS, we can see straight away that this is very different to other mini PCs. While it does seem clean with its light visuals, it becomes quickly apparent that the user interface is in fact rather clunky. And while the BIOS does have secure boot and a power selection pull down, it misses some key options such as a silent mode as well as other options for our fans. So we got out our Batacera SSD, plugged it up via USB, and what? So in order to get a Linux OS booted up, you need to change the bottom option to custom, otherwise the secure boot option at the top will not save. But at least, we can load up Batacera. And in Batacera version 39, it does detect our Wi-Fi, but as we have a very low signal strength, the connection is not stable. And the same applies to Bluetooth. It can find and pair up to our controller, but the connection is unreliable. So it's better to use a USB dongle for more arcade gaming. Like Metal Slug, CVS2, or if you fancy, a bit of quack. We've mentioned this a few times now, but the Wi-Fi is pretty poor. To get around that we can use an Ethernet LAN cable or a USB Wi-Fi dongle. As we have a full metal case, an external aerial is a necessity. So let's try to open her up. If you pull out the rubber feet, there's a screw hidden underneath each one. And to get these out, we'll need a small posi screwdriver. So the Wi-Fi antennas are at the bottom here. And we're really impressed, look at this heatsink. You can see how the memory is directly cooled by the fan. Let's see if we can open this up any more. There we go. And wow, look at that. So we can see that two thermal pads are included, as the heatsink is primarily there to keep the NVMe cool. The one included is a Lexar NM620, which is a PCIe Gen 3B4. They could have added something faster, but we don't mind too much, as we'd rather have quality over speed any day. 
The two sticks of memory are from Crucial, and these ones are DDR5 at 5600 mits. But what is very cool is what they did with the second stick, and it comes attached with this strange looking heatsink. If we remove the NVMe storage, we have access to the Wi-Fi chip. This one's the Intel AX210. We then disconnected the fan, remove the Wi-Fi module, remove the four screws, then we tried to remove the motherboard from the case, but it wouldn't easily budge. And as this is a fairly decent PC, we don't want to break anything, so we'll leave it as is. Let's check out the tempest and noise. At idle, our CPU stains around 40 degrees, and we have a pretty silent computer. Let's have a quick listen. Pull in just under 10 watts from the wall. Then if we put it under load, the CPU sticks around 81 degrees. And here's how it sounds. Pull in around 95 watts from the wall. Then we raised the power setting in the BIOS to performance mode, which did two things. It raised our TDP to 65 watts, giving us better performance, and made the fan work more, giving us lower temps and a bit more noise. Pull in around 100 watts. It's about time for the pros and the cons. The Alloy 9 is a well-made computer that's fast, fairly quiet, and has an emphasis on keeping things cool. The power profiles make sense in the BIOS, and even without using the performance mode, it can game. Unfortunately, Ryzen AI has not been activated, and the BIOS is rather clunky, but this all pales against this machine's main flaw, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth signal strength, which seems to be a factor that is always overlooked. So let's try comparing it to a few other 7940HS computers. This one's the GMK Tech K4, and it had cooling issues, as heat could not escape the top. There are some fan mods if you want to fix this, and they're on Thingiverse. There's also the cute Geekom A7, but the metal feels a bit plasticky. It has similar issues with the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth signal, and also with throttling, but it couldn't even finish a game of Rocket League without severe slowdown. We found the Alloy 9 to be similar in a way to B-Link Surf 6, with a focus on cooling, good components, and it being well-priced. The Alloy 9 is a great mini PC, we can definitely recommend it. We just hope that in the next iteration, they can place their antennas on the outside. Let's summarize. Fight, fight.